Now it's preparing. <clears throat> Yeah, we should be there now. So I will go to the YouTube channel and um, yeah, uh, let's see. Just a sec. Nicolai, you're looking like professionalist. <laughs> oh, just if I fall asleep. <laughs> uh, yeah, when do we have to go mute, Jens? Uh, right now? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, take it easy. So um, I think we should be. Um, Maybe not. Just a th yeah, just a second. So, we should, there's some conflict here. Um, <laughs> So, um, I hope this will do it. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I can. That's why we have this extra time in agenda. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, um, I have it here. So when. I mean, um, uh, it should be live streaming now, but mm -hmm. I have a problem on my second uh, screen. Um, so. Może już w końcu pieniądze nam dadzą. Um, we're running as far as I see. Yes, we it. are running. Yeah, we are, aren't we? Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not running. <laughs> I'm not running. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Uh, uh, just have to, uh, I don't know what I have to do here. Uh, um, afternoon session, yeah, it's now we are back again. Ha, okay. So, yeah. Good. Why isn't this playing? Yeah. So I think uh, we should be okay uh, right now. So uh, welcome back. Sorry for the uh, small hiccup here. Um, I have to uh, juggle between uh, different uh, 
screens and computers and uh, sorts of things. But uh, yeah, we should be uh, okay again. And uh, I will just uh, give an, a short overview of uh, the uh, session uh, today, the afternoon session. So uh, we uh, are yeah, uh, 10 minutes uh, late. I mean, uh, yeah, sorry for that. So uh, Andre will uh, start uh, with presenting the uh, yeah, uh, the fortress. Um, and uh, then we will go to uh, to Matt or so Matthew Nelson um, and uh, Laura Ligazzolo and uh, so uh, both uh, professionals in um, the let's say the outreach uh, aspect uh, of uh, this uh, project. So I will give the word to uh, Andre. Uh, please, um, please take it away. So uh, hello, everybody. I hope uh, everything's well and you are hearing me fine. Uh, we will discuss shortly about uh, the Wisłowice Fortress. It's a historian's perspective, actually. And uh, I will try to give you a very shallow outline of what we are doing at the Fortress. And Farther on at the end of the lecture, I, I hope that uh, I could uh, easily explain you all the details. So let's move to the, to the presentation. Share screen, share. And let's start the feed. Is it working? Yeah, it is. So uh, for those of you uh, who know uh, Wisłowiście Fortress in Gdańsk, call it in an archaeological gate, as in the title, uh, may seem quite an exaggeration. Uh, these words are only used to emphasize the uniqueness and richness, which we can discover in the eastern earthwork of the whole complex, or below the surface of the Dead Vistula River. Uh, these two words, so the archaeological gateway also refer to the function which this particular area fulfilled from around 18th up to the end of 19th century. This Wuxia fortress and its area were the gateway to Gdańsk and through the rivers uh, to Slavic Pomerania, Teutonic Prussia, either the crown of the Kingdom of Poland, and finally the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Before the fortress was built, people realized that the development of the trade center in Gdańsk depends on helping the merchants who might start flowing through the, uh, through the river to other parts of the medieval Polish realms. At first, fires were burned at the mouth of the Vistula. They indicated ships the right course to the entrance, safe from shoals. Around the middle of the 14th century, the Teutonic Knights erected a brick and wooden blockhouse with a pier for ships and a chapel and an inn for sailors. The knights not only managed the movements of ships, but also put various taxes for, for the merchants or fines from hot-blooded sailors who came here from all parts of Europe. During the Commonwealth, around 1482, fortification started to grow and gradually expanded around the medieval Gothic tower. This is the point in the middle of the slide. A cylindrical ref was built, then a quadrical fort, which you can see surrounding the, uh, the red dot, and later on earthworks, and next to them buildings and a church, and finally powder magazines. These are the, these are the long structures that can be seen uh, painted on red and violet colors. A smaller fortification was built on the other side of the canal, and you may ask for what purpose? It was only the introduction of such solution that meant that the access to the Vistula and thus Gdańsk and the Commonwealth was guarded. This is why the fortress has never surrendered in face of the enemies and never allowed to enter through its gates. The garrison seized defense only when the city of Gdańsk has capitulated. Only once, Swedes in 1628, during the so-called Battle of the Lighthouse, 
were able to bypass the fortifications of the sea fortification and sunk to ships of the royal fleet mooring close to it. So uh, the Swedes probably attacked from the south and they started shooting at, uh, starting the fire at uh, the two ships that were mooring close to the south. The ships retreated. And this is also a part of the archaeological heritage of the fortress that we will explain later on. Now that we know at least some of the background, we can move towards the question, what can we tell about the archaeology in this area? Uh, and the research started very soon in 1967. But as you see on the map, we know very little about the whole area, the trenches that were carried out in 67, 68, 69 uh, were very scarce. And later on, there is a huge gap. The excavation started in 2000, were carried out in 2003 and 2006, and only from 2013, we are constantly exploring the area around the fortress and in the fort to check what's going on. The truth is that uh, the most interesting finds have been destroyed by port dredgers, if we talk about the river in 1960s and 1970s. The same goes for field research. After Second First World War, the area was demilitarized and civilians moved in. In 1945, parts of the fortress were destroyed by preventive fire from Soviet guns. This is the state of the fortress around 1945. You can see almost complete destruction, uh, mainly because Soviets believed that this area is armed and there are German troops stationing there. After the war, Polish civilians started to move in and the fortress and the surrounding buildings became a settlement area. In the 70s of the 20th century, the residents left their flats as the sulfur industry and the port were to be created. Until then, up to 2009, the control over the area was rather impossible. And this is something that we deal with because uh, the upper layers of the earth, of the soil around the fortress are probably now devoid of valuable everyday objects of the past. They have fallen probably illegally into the hands of war military enthusiasts who inspected this area during the night. Despite all of that, you can still survey the external and internal mode of the fortress. So uh, I hope I will have the, oh, there's the laser point. So we can still inspect the inner mode and the external one, which is not visible here. We can still look for the ruins of one of the 10 foundations of the Saint, Saint uh, Olaus or Nikolai church. One is visible here. The other one probably should be somewhere over here. And the third foundation of which we are certain is over here. We might also, also look for cemeteries that we can, uh, that we suspect to be located in the vicinity of the rampart, probably somewhere around here. We might also move south to research a small settlement that was uh, thrived uh, in the shadow of the fortress somewhere from the early modern era. We can start also exploring a piece by piece of the stronghold to get a clear image of, of the development, of the spatial development of the fortress. And this is actually what archaeological research in the fortress go to this direction. So at one hand, we have the archaeology, the research. And on the other hand, we have a very good historical material that gives us an idea at what, in what place, what can we expect in one of the places that we will start uh, digging. After all, the fortress is perhaps the most interesting field for archaeological research in Gdańsk. And hence, it can be go, called the gate to its archaeology, a gate that can be used to development of tourists based on archaeology and thus archaeotourism. So I hope that the laser good. So uh, 
We have a very uh, shallow outline of what is going on in the fortress. So uh, when we think of developing archaeotourism, first of all, we need to have a basis, a facility that could sustain and make all these uh, things that happen in the archaeobalt happen after the project uh, ends. So thanks to the European Union and the Interreg South Baltic Sea 2014-2020 program, we create the foundations of archaeotourism. Support of such product means that uh, different actions should be taken in different areas. It is not only the idea that the content uh, is important, but also knowledge in many areas of other tasks, and yet perhaps the ability to disseminate information to target groups and further creating demand for given products and services might be the most essential issue. It is quite easy. We all love mysteries. We all love to be the first to discover things and share it and share them. Though our motives, of course, can be and they are different. Any good idea will fall. Any good idea will fall like a house of cards if there will be no will and cooperation between people and if there will be no adequate facilities supporting our actions. It is the infrastructure that performs the primary role. For the fortress, we were able to operate all year round uh, facility and maintain the movement of tourists who come here after the end of summer but encounter closed gates of the fortress. The reason will be, of course, uh, explained later. Before submitting the first Archaeobot uh, application, we assumed that uh, we will adapt rooms of the former parish house, but uh, and this building only needed uh, finishing works. For many reasons, we eventually moved to the Napoleonic barracks from sub supposedly from 19th century. That's the that's the building you can see on the slide. And thanks to the research, that's what we considered to be a building built somewhere around 191807, uh, turned out to be uh, an older building that we fought. This is thanks to the archaeobot archaeologists from Denmark and from Poland, whom you can see on the slides working, and also architectural and conservation research that were carried uh, during winter time. So not only uh, the, the later research not only allowed us to reconstruct the original layout uh, of the building, its purpose, but uh, also the possible date of construction. And this you can see on the bricks. It's a, a very, uh, it's a low quality photo but there is an inscription with a name and surname of the person and a date 1806. So perhaps this could uh, make us think that the building was older. And in fact, the foundments discovered by the archaeologists proved to be built somewhere around middle of the uh, 18th century. Despite uh, our efforts to fight the vi virus, we plan to open Wisłowiście Archaeological and Tourist Center next year, so it will be 2021. And let's keep our fingers crossed for keeping up this goal. Uh, the center will be a base for future international archaeological works. And also the visitors, the tourists will have approximately uh, 250 square meters with archaeological exhibitions and other ways to discover archaeology in form of augmented reality applications with various scenarios. It will be also a great adventure. And uh, what we want to do is to show the opportunities of exploring the richness of Borholm, Lund, and Ovid. So this center will also have the uh, function to force the tourists moving, showing them the potential and others, of course, uh, from which uh, Jens's will be also included. But uh, in the shadow of the archaeological touristic center from May to end of September, people will be able to discover monuments and their stories starting from below the ground. This is when we 
should move to the details. On the slides, you can see the Napoleonic barracks. Here you can see the old windows, the, the former windows that uh, the barracks had. The ones to the left are newer. They were probably done somewhere close to the end of 19th century. There are also other uh, points that uh, make us think uh, this way. There's, a, of course, a chimney and the stripe, which you can see here, is in fact uh, the, are the wooden foundments of the cellar that were running through the whole building. Uh, we discussed the issues, how to adapt this building for, uh, for the needs of the center. And uh, during the speeches, we were informed that we have to think of another way of adapting this building, not primary as we thought. So uh, this building, as in our previous plan, will not host uh, any students. We will move the, uh, the hosting facilities, uh, the quarters to the uh, inner courtyard of this Wojciech fortress, but this is just a um, song of the future. We've also discovered nice paintings. Uh, currently, the, uh, the research, uh, the uh, primary research has been completed, but uh, the wheel cannot uh, be faster than the cart. So we are waiting for scientific articles uh, that will be published about uh, the newest uh, discoveries at the fortress. They will include not only this building, but also uh, that what we excavated during uh, 21 days of field works uh, that were held in uh, July 2019. If we go to the details, the formula that uh, that is strongly visible in the Archaeobalt Fortress uh, focuses on large-scale festivals that attract thousands of people, and we concluded one that uh, one of these festivals in uh, early of uh, July 2019. It was also connected with Baltic sale, uh, so uh, this festival brought about 3.5 thousand uh, audience. Despite the rain, we had a very uh, bad weather. Usually, uh, when we carry out festivals at the Wisłowice uh, Fortress, they attract at least two times uh, bigger audience than the, the one that we uh, we've seen on Wisłowice uh, fifteen seventy seven. This is a uh, part of the re reconstruction of the battle that uh, occurred. Uh, during uh, during 1577, when King of Poland raided Gdańsk, who started to side mostly with the Danish. So this is also uh, a hint to uh, to the history of this region that connects it with Archaeobalt, but not in uh, Iron Age uh, or, or early medieval age periods. Uh, we also thought of another product. These were also foreseen in Archeobalt, so the uh, Archeo open days. During three, uh, four days of, uh, of excavations, we attracted around 1.1 thousand audience. And uh, they were shorter than, uh, than uh, our partners. Uh, why? The reason is very simple. So. Uh, it was briefly explained earlier when we discussed uh, the archaeology of uh, this Wojciech fortress. Uh, we deal with, because uh, the whole area is unprotected. There are several owners uh, on the uh, eastern earthwork of, of uh, this Wojciech fortress. We cannot uh, operate or make any gates that, that would... Uh, prevent people from coming during the night. So most of the excavations were carrying out in silence without any media uh, interest, only to gather the most interesting artifacts. And then when the excavations uh, came close to an end, we, uh, we put media information about the possibility to explore uh, the archaeological richness of uh, of our of our rampart so mostly youngsters came in this is what was uh, what were proven uh, that that this is a very good target audience 
with parents and uh, we, uh, we open several trenches. The one you can see to the right, uh, these are the foundments of 20th century building uh, that we know very well from photographs. Uh, these buildings were destroyed soon after 1970. So uh, up to 2009, this area around the fortress uh, gradually uh, changed. And uh, around those uh, those foundments, we found 2,000 items, mostly pottery, some metal uh, items, uh, coins, uh, and uh, coins, knives, and also bones. So the area that we've excavated mostly, we think it was used primarily for uh, gardening uh, activities. So people actually grew some sort of minor crops there. Uh, these finds that uh, we obtained during last years are not that spectacular as uh, as the research in 2000, when we found uh, when we found uh, mo that uh, when the most of the found material was in fact uh, metal. We thought also about making a third step to attract people to archaeology. Uh, this was Archeo, Archeo Urbex uh, walks that uh, the head of the Wyszcze Fortress uh, concluded with 29 participants. We thought that if we have a uh, few strong, two strong products that uh, attract many people, we have to think about something elitary. And uh, also connected with uh, the regions when, uh, where the uh, excavations have been concluded. So Archeo Urbe Urbex uh, walks were carried out mostly in the old gunpowder houses, uh, the Napoleonic barracks that were shown also to the audience. Uh, what is most important, people had to uh, reservate places or, or uh, they had to tell us uh, in advance that they are interested in taking these tours. So 29 is perhaps uh, not a big amount, but it also shows uh, the, the, the motives of tourists coming to the fortress and uh, their interest in something different than the fortress itself. Uh, three such uh, walks have been uh, concluded and they will be developed uh, during next years. Uh, we also think of other products that are foreseen in the Archeobald project. These are the board games that will be developed uh, by the spring of 2021. Uh, we've already discussed the issue with several producers uh, we've put them our idea how to make a game about archaeology in the South Baltic Sea region uh, possible. We had our idea, it has been changed. And what can we tell for now is uh, that this game will uh, consist of two phases. So during the first, our role will be to uh, maintain the artifacts in a certain medieval period of time. So. The game will be uh, through rival, through uh, each of the person will have to compete with other players for those artifacts. And then in the second turn, uh, they will be uh, put in a place of an archeologist that will have to find those uh, items that, we, uh, that we've uh, acquired during the first phase of the game. Uh, the game will be of course free of charge, it will be available available at uh, the partners' uh, seats, and uh, it will be thought this way that will that it will maintain uh, that will it will fulfill not only the uh, educational role at your homes, but also during educational lessons. So uh, this is something that also will uh, will bring the idea to the youngsters who are. Uh, the target group of this game uh, to develop the idea of travel, of uh, getting in touch with other places. And this is what makes our horizons uh, broader and also 
leads us to, to discover new places. Uh, we've issued two games last year. Uh, the one you can see here is uh, the Mosaic of Gdańsk. Uh, it's a game in which uh, you tell about your artifact and you place it uh, on a map of Gdańsk, also discussing uh, the your story with, with other participants. The game is uh, devoted for 10 persons. We are also making work, uh, edu educational workshops uh, around it. And the other game published here is for Vester Plata. Uh, the game that we will issue, so, so the game of powers for Archeobalt will be probably the same. It will use the same mechanism. So there will be a map, there will be places, and coins, markers uh, that will make the whole games. And they will, in fact, uh, be the artifacts that uh, from, from the Baltic Sea region, from Denmark, from Borholm, from Sweden, and uh, from Poland, that will play the uh, major role. So something similar to this game, also with dice, will be, will be produced. Last point, which... Uh, was briefly discussed uh, are the VR games and uh, augmented reality games. So in frames of the Archeobalt project, we think of developing three uh, applications. Uh, Borholm will probably go uh, into the model. Uh, Lund is working on uh, an application a movie that will explain you how the archaeologists work. So we, you, you could uh, move to a, a virtual trench and start working as an archaeologist. As for us, uh, for Wisłowusia Fortress, we see that uh, we need to fill some sort of uh, basics for, for our region. Uh, Wisłowusia is opened mostly during the summer season, during the late autumn and, and winter. We are closed. Uh, because this is nature 2000 regions and we have uh, bats inhabiting uh, the surrounding of the, of the fortress and inside of the rampart. Uh, so we have to seize all noisy events. We have to close the fortress and uh, the building, the Napoleonic building that will also have this VR reality games inside uh, will enable persons to go into the inner courtyard of the of the fortress through different times and uh, there will be three up to three different stories connected with the arch artifacts that will be shown uh, on the uh, on the exhibition so that's basically everything as you can see this wish has a very good uh, uh, mostly youngsters think very good of this Wisha fortress. There are even building the fort uh, on the seashore using just sand. We get uh, many such photos from from our uh, from our audience. We are also happy with this. This shows that uh, this proves that the area that uh, even ten years earlier was a remote place completely unattractive for tourists now, also thanks to the Archaeobalt projects uh, start to grow. At this point, uh, I think it would be good to stop talking and I'm all yours. If you have any questions, uh, shoot them straight and feel invited to discover this Wojciech Fortress in Gdańsk. It takes uh, quite time to get there, but uh, there are, you will meet fantastic people there sharing fantastic stories, not also not only about the fortress, but also about that what you can find under the ground of the Eastern Air Force. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Um, this is a wonderful presentation uh, of this spectacular site. Um, now, um, we are uh, a bit uh, yeah, over time because of uh, uh, these small technical hiccups uh, in the beginning. So uh, uh, sorry for that. So we are, we are uh, uh, I think, uh, around 
uh, 10 minutes delayed. I, I hope uh, uh, this is no uh, problem uh, for you uh, in the panel and for people uh, watching this uh, webinar. Now, um, do you, I see no questions from uh, the uh, audience. Do you in the panel have a quick question uh, to Andre, else we will, uh, we will give the word to uh, Matthew or Matt, as he's uh, also called, and uh, from uh, the uh, Linnaeus uh, University in Kalmar. And uh, I know that, uh, Matt, you are uh, working on a, uh, a dissertation on, uh, on, on, this, on these uh, topics uh, which uh, we have been addressing so far. So I am looking very much forward uh, to your uh, presentation and to uh, have your outside uh, view on this uh, project maybe. So please, Matt, take it away. Thank you. Uh, let's see now. How do I put it? Was this uh, share screen? Uh, there. Okay, share. And uh, let's see. It was uh, build spell and from Bullion. Okay. Uh, I'll just give a short uh, introduction who I am to begin with, because I haven't really met most of you before. Uh, I'm an archaeologist at the uh, company in the contract archaeology called Stiftus and Kulturmiljö Vård. And uh, since about a year now, I've also been a PhD student at the Graska. It's a graduate school of contract archaeology in Kalmar. The Linnaeus University. And uh, uh, my uh, research uh, theme is uh, concerns engagement and participation of people in archaeological heritage, especially within the scope of the archaeological landscape. And I think you presented uh, previously in the, uh, in the presentations very good views of how archaeology uh, connects with landscape in order to understand uh, the, the places you, you are investigating. So uh, on, uh, my, part of my, my aim is to study and evaluate the efficiency of communication methods within contract archeology span to enhance public knowledge and interest for the, the past. And also derive the physical and social factors that affect communicating uh, contract archaeology, and you mentioned uh, already in several places the, the sometimes the problems to transport yourself to the sites and so on and so forth. Uh, and my aim with the research is to show how to impl implement more focused and cost efficient methods in communicating contract archaeology. And I just want to say also that about a couple of decades ago, I used to work uh, as a maritime archaeologist at the Viking theme park in Fotoviken in southern Scania, where we were doing a lot of these type of outreach programs, reconstructing environments that I can see. So you, you, you have so many good examples of here. Um, so let's see now. The next. There. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to give a very quick uh, view on different views on landscape, of course. Uh, this is a, a picture that uh, a painting that shows Cuando Onate in 1626 discovering Grand Canyon. And he thought, of course, he discovered it, but there were, of course, people who had lived there for thousands of years already. And uh, up to the middle of the 19th century, this area was considered completely worthless. It would have nothing to, to give at all because you couldn't uh, uh, do any good uh, agriculture and things like that. But today, of course, the situation is different. I, I think in 2018, it had about 
seven million visitors. So it's all about the different uh, values that we create about different landscapes. And this is of course where the definition of landscape comes from as well. It's how we relate to different uh, types of spaces and then call them different places and so on. And uh, this view of landscape shifts through, through time, of course, it's mental as well as, well as physical, it's subjective as well as objective, and it's multivocal and, and depends on the viewer's objective. Uh, and it can work on the same time, both on an individual level, as well as a, as a community level. And uh, this is, of course, what you have to bring with when you're doing types of landscape assessments, how, value it, how valuable it is in economic terms and aesthetic terms, for instance. And uh, this is, is considered in order to justify special treatment or absolute protections. And uh, basically, this comes into uh, the view of, of heritage. And uh, the, there's, um, of course, the, the traditional view has been that there's uh, certain places that are, are considered uh, uh, suitable for being a heritage. But of course, this has been uh, um, debated in the last couple of decades, uh, what type of uh, uh, values should go into what, what is heritage. And also that heritage is not just a certain place, but it's something that you do. It's something you have to uh, connect with it in order for it a place to be a heritage. And uh, this all goes into very much into what uh, contract archaeology is about in Sweden. So an archaeological site in Sweden is a type of heritage that consists of a defined place or group of physical sites in which using the discipline of archaeology, evidence of past activity, usually predating 1850, is acknowledged and recorded. So these are a lot of sites that are protected, but whenever there is need for and, and uh, um, development of some form. Um, the county council makes decisions if this is a place that can be um, documented and removed. And in most cases, it's very seldom that uh, these ordinary sites anyway, uh, uh, is, is a hindrance for, for development. But we need to do, uh, through the Swedish law, you have to make an excavation before that. So um, uh, the thing is that a, a lot of the archeological sites in Sweden of, often consist of areas that in many times are invisible about the ground and hard to recognize. And you've seen it the same with Sort of mold and also a lot of Anupok as well. That uh, it's it's only when you really start excavating that you you have a chance to to uh, um, to see the places and and uh, yeah experience it in some way. And um, the time frame and accessibility for the public to take part in an excavation is is in many cases in contract archaeology quite limited. And the results is that not the knowledge from, from many excavations seldom reach, reaches the broader public and uh, that the, the archaeological site vanishes from the landscape without leaving a lasting trace for the public. Um, and uh, there's uh, been changes in, into the Swedish law now in 2014 where there's been a, put a larger emphasis that the archeological projects should include beyond the, the antiquarian uh, results, uh, also a larger portion of mediation and participation of the public. Uh, and this is the purpose of this is to create conditions that actively con contribute to enhance quality of life and that humanistic perspectives 
or given means to influence the development of society. And uh, this, of course, is something that I believe is uh, something that could also benefit tourism of, of these places uh, within this category. So otherwise we have to, of, of course, uh, look at how different actors and stakeholders work in contract archeology span and uh, uh, through, uh, throughout uh, the, the history of contract archeology, span there's often been a conflict between the interest of uh, developers and the cultural workers. So it's, it's, it's very beneficial if archeologists can be involved in this uh, developing process uh, as early as possible in order to make, find, common grounds, good solutions, and so on. And um, yeah. So what I'm, I'm looking at is contract archeology span as an event. And in my view, uh, you can see excavations as a continuous process of creating temporary and unique events, windows through which the public can experience the history of a place. And that excavations are a performative cultural act in real time. We talked about that before, and it's something that happens here and now. And it's something that brings a lot of uh, feeling of connection or originality and authenticity uh, in order to communicate uh, the archaeological nar narrative to wider audiences, uh, this is a tool to better understand the past narrative. And here is an example from uh, an excavation that took place uh, two years ago in the middle of the field beyond uh, a farmhouse. And it was on the uh, Swedish, it's about, yeah, it's basically almost uh, exactly two years ago. It was on the Swedish uh, um, weekend of Valborg, where people are a lot, uh, so, yeah, usually spend time with their families and so on for, so forth. And it was pouring rain and it was just mud and we didn't really have any, any uh, facilities to show that this is supposed to be a house. It's hard, hard to see, if you see the post holes. Uh, but uh, we had 150 people coming anyway, like that. And it shows the, uh, and this is right outside in the rural landscape. So it shows the local interest for what we are doing. You know? So I think there's a lot of uh, potential for, um, uh, yeah, using this, um, these resources that are given to us uh, as part of the, the, the Swedish law. Right? Uh, and this is uh, one of my case studies is Julsta. It's connected to, it's uh, an area in, in the suburbs of Northern Stockholm. And it was, uh, um, the excavation took place uh, at the time of uh, developing a new motorway for Bifart Stockholm. So basically you can see uh, in, in the distance here, this is one of the areas of the motor that way that will connect with, with this new, new part that will go around the, the western part of uh, Stockholm. So this is uh, a drone photo and shows the, just the first uh, uh, pre-excavation uh, trenches and so forth. And of course, for most people who, who uh, who, who living here, there were, there were some protests, but most of that was connected with the nature. So people uh, are known to connect with, with the nature a lot, but really didn't have any idea about uh, the, the site that we had here. And it was a, a big, um, a large uh, burial ground connected with areas where um, there had been settlements, but also, um, uh, we found uh, the, remain, the post holes of what we think was a re religious type of house that had, had connection with this burial ground. Uh, 
we, th we could claim that the name would be for this would be like a hall or something like that, or similar to to Uppok and so on, but it's not at all so fancy, of course. It's a very, it's much, works much more on a local basis. So, of course, here is what we have in Sweden, something called uh, Fonsök or Fonreg, as we use as archaeologists. And you can see these different types of uh, uh, archaeological sites. Uh, and this was the area that we were excavating. And, uh, but it's not used generally by the public to, to gain information. It's more, usually it's more for administration uh, purpose. So this is something I think they're trying to develop so we, you can get more information from it now. And I think it's, it's also necessary for, for this information to spread to the public to make use. And then again, the first immediate uh, view you have of a site can be quite confusing, especially if there's a lot of things going on. So this is the, the, the site for, for this hall, as we call it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's hard to see uh, what is what. Actually, there are some foxholes here because it used to be a military exercise field as well. So the, the, there had been, yeah, quite a lot of disturbance in the area as well. So, but it's easier to see with the aerial view. Uh, so part of the terrace, and you can see here the, the, the post holes. This is the foxhole. And yeah, it's, it's a bit, bit clearer to show it. And then, of course, analysis gives you the outline, how, how the big the house was, of course, eventually, and how different parts, this was like a, uh, you could call like a sacrificial place next to the, do the, the door uh, of the house. And you, you can see how, how things uh, connecting and also a sacrifice we found inside the, the, the house as well, uh, in form of a, I think it was an iron knife or something that was stuck into the post hole. This is quite typical you can find in, in Sweden. Uh, so, uh, and then you get into to interpretation. And of course, we don't have any remains at all. We've just found some wooden, uh, some charcoal and, and pieces of some of the post holes. We could see, see what type of, uh, wood that we used. Uh, in this case, it was oak and uh, pine. But uh, this is a comparison to another site that looked very similar with the data reconstruction. And uh, it, yeah, you have to start using uh, uh, artistic views like uh, and it, uh, get some uh, uh, comparisons. For instance, I think if for this model, they, they compared it a bit to the Norwegian uh, stave churches and so on and so forth. And of course, yeah, I know it's the same with Upokra, the, the, the reconstructions for that. And then it comes to storytelling. And it's important, I think, to, for, for the public to, uh, to, to get a narrative, to really connect to persons given a name or something like. And in my case, I made a just for fun, a, a bit of a ghost story connecting two of the soldiers who, who were in the foxholes and seeing this ghost story in front of them. And we actually got comments from uh, a couple of the readers who had themselves uh, had similar type of ghost uh, ex experience at, at the site before. So that was quite funny to hear that it actually connected to their personal experience of the site. And of course, interaction is a very important part of, of uh, uh, understanding a place and also connecting better to it, getting this authentic feeling. And of course, you can have setbacks. <laughs> this was in the uh, beginning of November. So then it becomes very hard to, to show this for or visitors. So this is a reality for half the year in, in Sweden. So uh, 
this is, I think we can develop more. That's why it's very good if we can develop uh, digital uh, tools that you can show different, and they, they started to do that as well. You can see film clips and things like that from the excavation itself. And of course, working with community, very important. This was a suburb area with a lot of immigrants. So there was a lot of interest to uh, try to uh, um, connect history with integration, of course, and getting outreach. And these are groups that usually are not very interested in, in what we were doing. Usually it's uh, historical, local historical societies and people who are uh, retired and so on, senior citizens. And of course, we were working a lot with schools as well. But it's important to get these outreach programs. And uh, these were some of the tools we used. It, uh, it was called On Spot Story, where you can walk around and see some of the places in, in, the, in the area, and you get information about these different sites. And uh, there is a trail, historic trail with signpost signs that's supposed to last even after the excavation took place. There's the um, yeah, material for schools teaching, and it's also working together with the developers, uh, the web page and so forth. Um, but yeah, basically, I think we need to look back to our own roots, you know, why do we think what we're doing is interesting? What, what is it that, makes us choose this uh, type of work and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think we need to uh, uh, stimulate that type of feeling also to, to the people who visit us and also in, see that there are wider possibilities to, uh, to reach out. Uh, and I think especially in these days with, with the, the, the corona, uh, virus gives us the possibility of uh, developing better digital methods for this. Yeah, I don't know if do I have any, how much time do I have left? Do I have any time left or? Yeah, I mean, uh, we started uh, um, 10 minutes. So, so you have uh, some more minutes if, yeah. if, if you need okay. it. Okay, yeah, basically, well, the thing is, uh, what I've looked into how we can develop our, our um, uh, dissemination of results and, and also get being part, uh, participating better. There are different types of uh, new media as well that you can use. Um, a new tool is called uh, Story Map, for instance, that you can use. Uh, uh, it's free to download, but if you have archies, you can use it to, uh, to store even more amounts and you can use film clips, for instance, connected with a map, just like the on-spot story I showed before. And uh, of course, working more with 3D models is becoming more uh, common, uh, and especially in places where you can't have any uh, good, uh, uh, yeah, guides, guidings on the site. There's sometimes it's very restricted or hard to reach or so, so on. Uh, and this works with drones and photogrammetry, for instance. And uh, you have uh, examples from um, in old Uppsala, where Deezer have worked with this, of course. And you have Nya uh, Lerdöse uh, outside Gothenburg and uh, Sandibori on the Öland also done 3D reconstructions. And a lot, a, a few of my Graska um, uh, colleagues, student colleagues are looking into di different parts of the, this, these areas. And also one maritime archeologist who's looking into how to uh, uh, show uh, shipwrecks, which is of course very hard if you don't dive. And there's a very good uh, example in the form of mush, it's a Swedish warship that uh, is outside Öland, but it's, it's supposed to be shown at the Museum of Vestervik 
and, and it actually gives the the feeling of diving as well when you're looking at the, the, the model and of course digital networking is very important we're now working on a, a project uh, that's starting up on Ostlenken. that's going to be one of the largest swedish excavation areas for the next five years we're working together with senior um, yeah, local history societies, and uh, we just uh, yes, last night we had a, um, a meeting with them over the uh, Zoom. And of course, it's it's hard for these old people to uh, they're not supposed to go outside in Sweden, <laughs> even if everybody else here can do it actually still. Uh, and uh, we were trying to find new ways to connect to them and teach them how to use the media better as well and and also get in behind the curtain, how we work with maps and how we work with different type of archives and things like this. So it's really fun to see, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use that for a pilot study to see how we can develop this further. But uh, like I said, I'm very interested to see how we could use this trend, this uh, movement of, getting also additional resources from the government government to do more mediation and participation. And this could actually be part of the tourist sector, even though uh, contract archaeology sites are not permanent, like Uboka or so forth, but it's an ongoing process that continues all the time, actually over longer time of the year. So if you can find good platforms to connect that, you could probably, especially like Oslenk and that's a certain region also as well. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen on uh, learning more from your examples and Siri as well. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Matt. This was uh, brilliant to see these uh, different examples, also your uh, approach of uh, of integrating uh, the the public, I mean, I was very impressed of having the the crowd of 150 people looking at at uh, yeah at uh, at dirt basically. Uh, so uh, I I put a small comment. Yeah, I hope you don't uh, uh, are too angry with me. Then I I wrote the old Swedes had really comfy houses. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, so. Um, yeah um now we will um go to our uh yeah there are no questions on my panel if if the panel has a quick question because else uh time is running and we will try to keep on schedule so uh Can please... I ask questions? Just one. Yeah, yeah well well yeah okay okay <laughs> uh, thank you for that presentation it was great matthew um, I was just wondering, because you're using such a lot of different methods for engagement, um, how are you assessing their impact and do you have any sense of which are working best and which are most sustainable, which we can uh, hopefully learn from as well? Yeah, well, the, this is something I'm looking into. I mean, it, it's it's going to be hard to do um, the back, uh, going backward in time and try to uh, get the response of uh, from the public on, on this in this first case study they, it was conducted in 2016 so that will have to be it's still the evaluation has not taken place this was supposed to take place this spring but i'm working together with that at least to get the feeling from how schools felt about it and also the different types of um, uh, societies that were par part of it and still are part of it so um, my hope is uh, to work with new case studies is that I can actually do these type of assessments uh, while it's ongoing in, in different types of surveys and uh, interviews and so forth. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, that's something I, I'm thinking of uh, continuing with. I think it's very important to get that type of uh, evaluation of how, how well these projects and also especially if it's like a, a, a new uh, method, uh, how well that is um, uh, received. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, we have well, totally new perspectives also on Andre, I can see. Uh, 
Andre, I think you should uh, move your camera uh, a, a bit. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, uh, yeah, um, now uh, uh, talking about perspectives, uh, uh, Laura uh, Ligazzolo, I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly, uh, will give us uh, a, another perspective on uh, what we call archaeotourism. And this is, uh, let's say, linked to the um, cross-border uh, issue of, uh, of archaeo routes. I mean, uh, you are um, addressing um, uh, macro regions. Uh, so I understand that also as a uh, cross-border perspective. I hope I'm right. Uh, so please, uh, Laura, uh, take it from here. Let me share the screen. Let's see. Okay. Can you just give me a sign whether you hear, you see? Does it work? Okay. <laughs> so I'm Laura Ligazzolo, you pronounce it perfectly. And I work for the Council of Europe <laughs> on, a, on a program with the European Union. And the project is called Roots for You, Fostering Regional Development Through Transnational Cultural Roots heritage policies and practices in the four EU macro regions. So I'm neither an archaeologist uh, nor <laughs> an excavator <laughs> nor a professor, unfortunately. I come actually from the domain of human rights and international relations, but I think it's always uh, useful to try to step uh, each of us uh, a bit outside of our shoes, uh, our field of uh, uh, expertise and uh, exchanging experiences to learn. So I think uh, this, uh, this initiative you have today is very beneficial, so thank you. Um, this is not the time, people don't want to hear about it, uh, we should not give the wrong message. I don't know whether you, but I did hear this type of concern very often in the last weeks concerning talking about tourism, talking about cultural tourism, cultural heritage, in view of course of the of the pandemic and of the, the COVID confinement. And I do think that it's the time too, because uh, uh, tourism and hence also cultural heritage is one of the most affected sectors at the time. And as uh, Jens uh, said at the very beginning, we have to think uh, uh, in a way to, 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 to shift uh, and in a strategic view for the recovery after for a different type of tourism. That, uh, thinking about what will be possible and also what people will look for because uh, there will be a trend yes in uh, local tourism more and uh, uh, less attractive destination not crowded uh, <laughs> crowded places so i think it's very important that we keep on discussing this with this in mind um so just a bit of the outline of the um, the different steps i will try to go through in this uh, half an hour so I will start from interreg and cultural roots. As I told you, I don't come from an interreg project either. Are there interlinks? Yes, no, if yes, which are they? Why does it make sense that we have this dialogue? Then a second step, it's about the cultural roots of the Council of Europe program, indeed. And the third point about roots for you, so the very cooperation project uh, I'm working on. And a fourth final step about uh, specific experiences, tourism good practices uh, to, to share about, okay, how do we put uh, into, into practice uh, this uh, overview, this understanding of heritage and uh, uh, transnational tourism. So uh, starting from the first point, uh, interreg cultural roots. We do have many points in common because we both, first of all, are cooperation projects. We started from stakeholders, partners who do share an, an objective and an interest in starting a joint venture. So this is what brings us together first. And then, of course, the rationale, which is behind, meaning on one hand, tackling common challenges, starting from some sort of weaknesses and points to address in the sense of <laughs> improving. And on the other hand, also recognizing which are the common resources, which are the common benefits that we have to make uh, the most out of it through cooperation. So trying to increase efficiency uh, from that point of view. Another point that we have in common, the regional framework. You are an inter working on an interreg in the South Baltic, that's a regional dimension. Cultural roots, and yes, I'm always referring to cultural roots of the Council of Europe, 
are not necessarily regional in nature because they um, they grow as European first as a scope. But uh, there is a specific category of cultural roots which is territorial, and it's really a type of category which. Uh, um, is based on cultural roots which are shared by a given territory. Just to give you an example, we have uh, the uh, Roman emperors and Danube wine route. Uh, the name is very evident that it's a route along a given territory along the Danube. So this is uh, an example. And then uh, also we are working on some um, field of actions which are in common. So uh, heritage, cultural heritage and tourism are uh, on, in the spotlight. And uh, I appreciate it very much reading through the, the description of the aims of this, uh, this webinar and also reading some, some documents about Archeobalt that the objective um, goes beyond the touristic promotion and touristic development. I read uh, that it's about also developing a sense of joint social responsibility for the Baltic heritage. So um, this idea of raising awareness and creating a sense of ownership about heritage is very much important and paramount for projects we are working on different ways about with common uh, trends. And on this, I would like to quote uh, the European Cultural Convention, which is one of the earliest convention that was adop adopted by the Council of Europe. We date back to 1954. The organization was established in 1949. So for you to understand, we are at the very beginning of that uh, organization. And it was very clear for, from the beginning that in the aftermath of the World War, with the objective of, again, bringing together the states in a cooperation uh, structure, cultural heritage should have been uh, considered as a resource to, to start from. And indeed, the convention states that uh, one of the objective is to improve the collective awareness of Europe's cultural sites and their incorporation into the leisure culture. So, uh, even the perspective of uh, making this a tool for development was evidently clear. And the fact of protecting heritage uh, and promoting it uh, is not uh, excluding the fact of also developing it as a resource and making also profit out of it. Another key point is that uh, many interreg deal with the idea of cultural roots. Uh, if I understood correctly, also Archeobalt aims at developing uh, roots, but also cultural roots of the Council of Europe, which were certified, developed then interreg project. I give you some concrete example. Atrium is the um, cultural route of the Council of Europe dedicated to totalitarian architecture of the 20th century. Actually, they started as an interreg in 2011, 2013. In the 2014, they obtained the certification of the Council of Europe and then they develop an interreg again. So one thing is not excluding the, the other. Another example, the Hansa, is one of the strongest cultural routes in the Baltic Sea region because it's dedicated to the Hanseatic network of medieval time. And it means that still keeping this network alive of 185 cities around. Uh, they develop an interreg which, are, which is called Exploranza, and they are at the same time cultural route. A very similar example with the Vikings route, again, another one, a very emblematic cultural route in the Baltic Sea region. Um, and this year, for instance, uh, um, we are working with uh, an interreg project that came to an end. It's called the Iron Age in the Danube, and they will apply uh, for certification, and we help them in this, uh, in this process. So I mentioned several times cultural roots of the Council of Europe. I kept repeating it. What am I talking about? So this is a program of the Council of Europe that dates back to 1987. A cultural route is defined, as you can see on the screen, as a cultural, educational, heritage and tourism cooperation project aiming at the development and promotion of an itinerary or a series of itinerary based on an historic route a cultural concept, figure or phenomenon with a transnational importance and significance for the understanding and respect of common European values. So 1987, we are at the time at which Europe was still divided again. <laughs> we are uh, still in the Cold War period and it was understood, okay, we need to start again from culture. That's a way of bringing citizens together and make them understand what links them. So this was very evident. 
um, the objective to um, promote the richness of the diversity and, and also to render shared European values into something tangible. Um, and uh, looking at the, the definition, we can find some, some key elements which uh, um, describe a project of a cultural route. So again, the cooperation element, uh, the objective of development of these uh, uh, itineraries, paths, and uh, the heritage element on which they are based, mm, which, yes, it's maybe an historical phenomenon, a given artistic movement, uh, a key uh, historical um, person, and this should have, uh, yes, a European-wide scope in terms of values, but also in terms of, for instance, an artistic movement like uh, um, Art Nouveau, the Liberty style, had a different interpretation in different countries. So today we have uh, 38 cultural routes of the Council of Europe uh, in Europe. And this map you see there, it's the countries of the enlarged partial agreement. So it's uh, an agreement among states who do agree to support financially and politically this project. You see it's really Europe-wide, from Norway to Russia, even Turkey is part of it, Portugal. Uh, concerning the topics and the themes, um, there are very strict criteria for obtaining this certification. And the certification and evaluation process, which takes place every three years, for the certified cultural routes, it's a way somehow to keep on with given standards. You see here the main uh, themes and the field of action that are requested to be worked on. So have a topic which is representative of European values. So to see beyond the, the local heritage, the local identity, which is the European sense of this. Can we find links with other uh, countries? Then the cooperation aspect in research and development. And this is key because uh, when it comes to heritage, Interpretation is always a, an issue. So it's important to have a scientific committee made of experts like you, academics, who can provide a sound understanding and interpretation of this heritage. Because apart from the, how to say, the content of the message, the way it is uh, conveyed and uh, disseminated, it's, it needs to be sound on uh, research. The objective of enhancement of memory, heritage and uh, European history, then one point on which I understood you are working very much, the cultural and educational exchanges for young Europeans. So the focus on the educational aspect of heritage, it's not only knowledge for the sake of knowledge, which is definitely worth in itself, <laughs> definitely, but it has also purpose that goes beyond and it's about educating. Um, and then uh, the work with uh, incorporation uh, cultural artistic practices, uh, I saw many of your example with like festivals. It's a way of disseminating and uh, reaching out, communicating, and the development of cultural tourism um, and sustainable cultural tourism uh, development. What um, uh, is somehow cross-cutting uh, these uh, areas, and I refer to, to, to our resolution, that is the basis of the certification, is the objective to promote dialogue between urban and rural cultures, between regions in the south, north, east, and west, and develop and disadvantaged regions. This is particularly relevant for all regions, but also for the Baltic, where uh, tourism is uh, concentrated in given spots. And there are uh, rural areas, areas which are out of uh, the, the normal reach of touristic uh, trends. Another, another point is uh, the, the key aspect of seeking partnership with public and private organizations. Several of you pointed to this uh, as a key uh, strategy in order to develop touristic products and target different potential groups with an idea of diversifying the offer in order to respond to a diversified demand and with the idea of developing a quality tourism. Is it all okay? Can you hear me still? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so these are the, um, the criteria concerning the team, and then we have the criteria concerning the, the network. So the fact that uh, uh, a structure needs to be legally established, this is to ensure the sustainability of the cooperation that is not a spot and, and uh, is not brought forth. 
and that the organization has to be democratic in the way it works. If we are talking about transnational routes, routes which are crossing different countries, at least three, this is the minimum standard, then this must be represented also in the structure which organizes and takes decision about this transnational network. What do we do in specific with Roots for You joint program? So this is my, my third point. You see this map, this is the map of the uh, European Union macro regions. You see in blue, it's the Baltic one. And actually this was the very first strategy which was um, adopted in 2009. Then we have in green the Danube region. It was adopted in 2010, the Adriatic and Ionian region 2014, and the Alpine region in 2015. What's the idea behind the, these strategies? There are three, no. <laughs> the basis it might seem absurd but makes sense so no uh, new funding in the sense that the strategies do not come with funding for instance interreg it's a funding under the territorial cooperation and the strategies are not meant at duplicated funding no new institution the idea is to bring together existing um, institution and foster a more um, uh, efficient cooperation and no new legislation Again, it's the idea of not creating new, but bringing together what's already existing. The strategies indeed are defined as a policy framework. Uh, the countries which are part of them do identify their own objectives, topics of interest, priorities to tackle and set an action plan to do so. For the Baltic Sea region, the objectives are saving the sea, because, of course, the sea is the unifying element of the Baltic Sea region. <laughs> That's the, 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 what you have all in common, for sure. Then, of course, connecting the region. And a third point about increasing prosperity. And under the policy area of increasing prosperity, there is also the attention to culture and, and the tourism. You see, we work with the macro regions and with the cultural roots. We try to bring together these two uh, perspectives. Again, the idea of tackling common challenges and making uh, the most out of common resources. Some examples of activities, very practical. And e-learning. So we developed a free accessible online course with five modules, with uh, different uh, resources, uh, assessments, uh, additional literature and possibility to delve into the issues we developed this in cooperation with academic experts what are the topics assessed i tell to you because i think it's cross-cutting several of your activities uh, so the first uh, okay it's about the cultural roots uh, of the council of europe the certification for those who are interested in engaging in this process the second one is about cultural tourism in remote areas so how to increase the attractiveness of remote destination, rural areas, and how to bring to this, that uh, um, link between rural and urban areas most uh, advantage and most disadvantage. So this is the second topic. The third one is about uh, social inclusion, community participation, so very much related to what uh, uh, Matthew was uh, referring to. And then uh, we have an, uh, module number four, which is about the cooperation with SMEs. So how to make the most out of a cooperation with activities, economic activities, which are at the grassroots level, where the sites are located, where the heritage is, where the community is. And then a fifth module about very much communication, marketing, how to uh, make sure to get the message through and reach out to, to the audience. And so these are the five modules. Three are already online. If then we have time, I can, can show you how they look like. Two will be online and there are also manuals that we are preparing. So um, to give the same content in a publication-like format, which can, be, which can be used. Another activity which serves the purpose of increasing the, the knowledge and the attractiveness of destination, we develop a digital platform, a trip planner, so a tool to develop, uh, to plan your own trip. It works, uh, as you see with this uh, image uh, on, on the left, uh, with, by filters. So of course, uh, it's possible to filter by the, the topic we are interested in, gastronomy, archaeology, architecture, art. We can decide uh, the region, and we can decide uh, the cultural route. 
then the, the system is like a search en engine and it, uh, of course, uh, uh, selects the filters, with the, 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 um, the sites and destination which do correspond to your filters. And it provides, of course, always the geolocation info, uh, a short description about that site uh, complemented by um, images and also uh, information on like uh, opening times. If we are talking about a museum, uh, we need to know when <laughs> it's open and it's related to interrail to see whether there are possibilities for you to move with using the train from one destination to the other. Indeed, you can save your own destination, change the order among them and see how move, how much time, how much kilometers are there in between this, this destination. So this is an example. Um, then we do several other activities. We have uh, several studies undergoing about the economic impact of cultural routes, about uh, the policies on cultural routes, always with a regional perspective. And uh, yes, for instance, one of these uh, studies is uh, a manual on signposting. When it comes to transnational cultural routes, uh, uh, it's one of the issues to have uh, panels, signals, which are recognizable as part of one route, which crosses border. So to have something that corresponds on one hand and is consistent with the local rules and regulation about uh, how to signal sites, how to sig signal direction, and on the other hand, to make it evident that it's part of a broader network. So now let's come to the last point. I hope I'm on time, I think so. Uh, with some more concrete, uh, um, specific example of good practices I, I, I've seen of the cultural rules, uh, in the view of yes, again, exchanges and exchanging experience, and we might find some some inspiration points to to work on. I try to to group them according a bit to thematic, and uh, so we we always with the, the perspective of how to say uh, the the challenge of finding the right balance between protecting, between promoting, between sustainability. I mean, many of the questions that uh, um, Professor. Um, Mats Rosmund was referring to at the beginning, so I, I hope I will touch upon some of these aspects. So let's start with this image that you see on the uh, top left. Uh, Straupe here. I don't know how many of you know Straupe. Um, actually, it's um, a very small town in uh, Latvia, and it's part of the, the Hanseatic cultural route. Uh, so Straupe was uh, located at the crossroad of uh, um, several trade routes and in the uh, medieval time it was a, a very important center. Then uh, it uh, underwent uh, uh, an underdevelopment, especially also because of the Swedish-Polish war <laughs> that was referred to also before. And like records say that just two inhabitants were left alive. So, if this was the destruction that he brought in terms of human resources, even the, how to say, built architectural resources were very much affected. So we say a very small site and undergoing some uh, uh, decay, what made, um, what worked as a key strength for Straupe? So Straupe was small, but part of a larger network, part of a cooperation network. So the fact of being part of the ANSA made really the trick in the sense that in the last decades, the ANSA organized a whole branding action around it. And they found out through research that Straupe was the smallest Hanseatic town. And around this, they built a whole, whole communication strategy. Um, and then they focused a lot on the local uniqueness and local products. So for instance, Straupe became also the first and the only uh, slow food earth market in the Baltic Sea. So this example shows how uh, small is not necessarily bad and how the trick there was in finding the unique element and in being part of a broader cooperation network. So this is one example. Then we can go to this other image uh, on the bottom of Straupe. And this refers to the Cluniac sites in Europe. It's another certified cultural route of the Council of Europe dedicated to the Cluniac uh, 
uh, site. We're talking about abbeys built uh, in, the, in the Middle Age, and Cluny is the most majestic one uh, in, uh, in France. What did they do? Mm, so several of these ar abbeys are still uh, in well shape, let's say. It's possible to visit them, and they are uh, marvelous. Some other underwent uh, some uh, deterioration. And so what did they do? They built Clunipedia. It's an, an encyclopedia, both work online as a website, as well as an app. They first mapped all the sites in, um, in Europe. We are talking about more than hundreds so that it's possible to always understand where is a given site and for a, a person to see and check this. And then they complemented this with photos to give a virtual uh, tour and also with um, uh, virtual reality um, um, features. So when this uh, tool is used also on spot, and if I point my given tablet at a destination um, and direction where there was the, the wall of that abbey and today is no longer there, I can have still uh, an impression, an aperçu of how that looked like. So it's a way of bringing somehow an heritage which is no longer tangible, closer to the, the, the visitor. And uh, you see here in the middle that they have also a specific ed edition of this uh, targeting children, of course. The way uh, the message is addressed to different groups uh, uh, should, should be different. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, um, one example. Another example of using digital tools, I think also during this pandemic, we all witness a lot of the importance and the resource that having access to galleries um, mu of museums online, to having access to libraries of resources that would otherwise not be open and accessible has been beneficial also for our, yes, for our well-being, for our interest of knowledge. So this uh, image you see here, this uh, person with um, the smartphone, uh, it depicts uh, um, symbols. This is an app developed by the European Cemeteries route. Yes, we have also a cultural route dedicated to cemeteries. And uh, actually it, uh, mm, it provides with the opportunity to understand the different symbols in the uh, cemeteries. So um, cemeteries which are very famous, I quote just one like uh, Père Lachaise in, in Paris. Okay, we know who is buried there, to, there that famous artist, that famous writer, uh, painter, but uh, uh, even in the sculptures, the structure of the um, cemetery, we might not always get uh, uh, what's the symbol about. Yes, the angel is very common, but he's not the, the only one. So um, this app provides a way to understand these symbols and also the different interpretations in the different uh, countries. Another uh, example of good practice, this image where you see written Atrium Go. So that is the same uh, cultural route I mentioned at the very beginning about uh, totalitarian architecture. So totalitarian regimes of the 20th century Europe. Uh, what did they do? They worked with the high schools in the cities which have this uh, uh, heritage to develop uh, um, tourism uh, tours and also to uh, train tourism guides addressing the same target group of young people from high school age. So this was a way to bring somehow together uh, the offer and the, the demand in the sense of making this link between targeting young people who know best than them how. <laughs> to, to be effective uh, in, uh, in this. Of course, this with, yes, the, the, the whole structure of people from, from the field with uh, um, architects, uh, as well as uh, with um, uh, ar artists, uh, as well as with uh, local authorities. So this is one uh, example, but uh, yes, when it comes to young people, uh, yes, I, I heard uh, very much with pleasure all, all the activities that you are already, already doing. Then other examples, this image with this lady who's um, working with a uh, doe. Uh, the, the topic here is a, a strategic partnership and uh, taking on entrepreneurial uh, um, point of view. So um, the roots of the olive tree, and again, another certified cultural route of the Council of Europe, uh, developed a project called Well Olive. It's based uh, on uh, experiential uh, laboratories, and training to develop experiential tourism uh, packages and activities. Uh, 
uh, and this is based on a very um, comprehensive uh, understanding of the heritage of the olive tree, which has a use in with culinary purposes, but also for wellness purposes, and it uh, brings with it a whole knowledge of the know-how and traditions on how to use these uh, um, land resources. So they made uh, these uh, um, um, experiential labs and they also along it uh, made uh, a blogger's trip. And this is still possible to be uh, visited on, online. So there, uh, the cultural route got a benefit in terms of promotion, but also the local products and the local identity was very much more uh, promoted. Uh, another example of um, cooperation and partnership was developed by Via Francigena. It's a cultural route dedicated to um, the route that uh, an archbishop in Canterbury took to go to visit the Pope in Rome. So he wrote a diary and it's possible today to walk along this route. What did they do in Italy? It's very common to walk along, along it, it's very well known. They made a partnership with Train Italia, which is the national train line company. So who travels along the route can get a discount. So this is a way of somehow promoting an incentive to take uh, the train instead of the car and to get to know which are the different sites uh, which are uh, passed through by the, by the route. Uh, the same cultural route, the Via Francigena, you see the image with that big uh, cheese, uh, cheese piece on the top. Um, they made um, a whole, uh, they developed a whole tourism um, product called Stop and Taste. And so they work with local producers, local farms, especially of Parmigiano Reggiano, because that is one of the uh, areas which is passed through to give uh, pilgrims, to um, give to tourists also the possibility to try and get to know about local foods. Again, also here, this proved to be a win-win uh, um, situation in the sense that uh, farmers and local producers got promoted via uh, the cash route and the cash route got promoted via the, the, the local uh, producers. Uh, and um, Via Francigena also made a partnership with local authorities in the Tuscany region with the um, entity in charge of tourism uh, promotion. Uh, they made a whole branding study and research, but just to give an example of how this was successful, from 2011 to 2014, they uh, witnessed an increase of 30% of arrivals of tourists in the destination passed by the Via Francigena, who had worked on this uh, promotion with tourism operators. So in, in four years, uh, a 30% increase was a quite uh, visible um, result. And I will uh, come now to the last two examples. I hope I'm on time, yes. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so one example here, you see this kind of um, brochure where it's written 2019. Of course, you cannot read it, but I tell you what's about. Um, it was developed by the prehistoric rock cart uh, trail. So you work on archaeology, uh, and I can just imagine how hard it must be to promote a, a type of heritage which has his own very specific challenges, uh, very different from what we were seeing before, like the roots of the olive tree or totalitarian architecture. So it's very different, peculiar from your field. Um, but here is an example that I think might, might work. Um, so what did they do? They organized these uh, events in different sites, part of the route in different countries in the framework of the European Heritage Days. So a first element, they try to uh, get a hold on a broader uh, scope. Then second point, what did they do? Uh, they organized like uh, lectures and storytelling session addressed to different uh, target groups from, from children uh, to um, young people and to adults in which a person who's uh, capable of telling stories. Uh, it's important, I mean, it's not always an issue, I think, of how much a, a, a topic in itself is interesting, how much a heritage in itself has value, but the, the way the story is told uh, makes a huge difference uh, in terms of attract attractiveness and of understanding. So they developed this uh, session with storyteller and expert, academics, person who knew the uh, sites, the destinations, 
uh, and what they were doing. They were not only telling the story of the site, but also the story of the ex excavations. So uh, how can we, I mean, it's very challenging to bring somehow a prehistoric rock art close to us. I mean, we feel it very long, uh, tiny time ago, definitely far from us. It's difficult to uh, somehow approach it to us. So telling the stories of the person behind the excavation was a good way of making somehow the link. Um, then the very last example, this image you see on the bottom uh, right corner, comes from Transromanica, which is the cultural route dedicated to uh, the Romanesque architecture. Again, it's a, a style of architecture of the medieval uh, times. Um, what were they thinking? They say, okay, there are still several um, castles uh, in Europe, uh, which are still majestic uh, in, the, in the structure and they, they can attract tourists. This is not the issue, but what is lacking maybe is the understanding of, of how were these ca ca castles built? How much time did it take? So what did they do in Austria in cooperation with local authorities? They decided about starting building a castle according to the 20th century uh, methods. I know how. So uh, basically there is a construction site that you see and they are using just the material and working methods that date back to, to the time. So the people you see in the image, they are not uh, actors, people who do like a reenactment, who yes, uh, try to, to, <laughs> to take this role, but they are really carpenters, <laughs> blacksmiths, and it's possible to see how material is transported, how material is worked on. And this uh, uh, project was also serving with the objective of giving employment to local people, uh, like indeed blacksmiths, carpenters, who might have otherwise find it difficult uh, in the region to get uh, unemployment. So um, there are different strands which are uh, attained somehow in a parallel uh, way. And that's a very ambitious plan. They think it will take about 30 years to build uh, <laughs> this. But uh, I mean, so far it's working. They work and at the same time, it's possible of course to have a tourist guides and people come and visit. And it's a bit linked to what you were saying. If I understood it correctly, uh, I saw some of your pictures. You have excavation sites. Some parts are already excavated. In other, you are conducted excavation also with uh, uh, the participation of different groups. So this is a way of working together and making the discovery <laughs> at the same time and to render the idea of this dynamic process. So uh, I would finish here. I hope I give somehow some hints which are useful for discussion and I'm very happy to uh, answer your question. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Laura. This was really impressing and uh, I uh, have uh, been, uh, let's say, multitasking uh, during your presentation and, and, and uh, visited uh, the, uh, the website of the Cultural Roots. And it is, I think it's very, very impressive. Um, and I must admit, um, yeah, sorry, uh, I, I, I didn't know of its existence. So uh, don't. <laughs> Don't hit me too hard, uh, but uh, it is very, very uh, imp 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 and 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 I'm yeah, and I'm surfing and looking for uh, how to apply and uh, how to qualify and 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 so so I, I'm I'm sure um, yeah we will we we will take this on board. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, Laura, also from your uh, outside perspective, because as uh, if you're an insider, let's say you, you may be, uh, I mean, uh, in the discipline, you may be a bit focused on, uh, uh, well, uh, have a different focus than uh, people uh, from the outside. So thank you very much. Now, um, uh, yeah, um, we are now uh, at the uh, last um, part of our uh, webinar, and uh, so we are at the uh, open um, question and answers. Uh, so um, there is uh, 
one person here on the um, chat who is interested in the uh, rock art trail. So I will tell him to to visit the website and then and, and so I and I have a suggestion or, or suspicion uh, who that who that guy is. Uh, I think it's James. Uh, so so, he, <laughs> so uh, yeah, okay. Um, but um, yeah, um, now I think uh, Laura addressed uh, the uh, the topic of uh, evaluation and assessment of um, of let's say uh, different initiatives. So I think we, if I can. Yeah, Laura, you can repeat that question, or, or, or because I think, uh, yeah, both Laura's uh, here uh, may have a, a, a topic which uh, we all have a severe interest in. So I will, yeah, I will give you to the word to uh, to to the Aarhus Laura, and then uh, I hope that. Uh, <laughs> that uh, yeah um, yeah i have to shut up uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so just a sec yeah. uh yeah thank you so much for that talk it was fascinating and i loved how often issues around sustainability and issues about layering of benefits came through about the things are not just one dimensional it's not just about getting tourists but creating identities about employing local people and so i suppose one question i would like to ask that jens has brought up is in terms of you know, do we have any um, best practice um, kind of documents and manuals from the Council of Europe around what they have found have been really great techniques for layering these kind of activities for making them more sustainable? Because you had some great examples. I'd love to be able to go through them in more detail. Um, and secondly, just about some of the case studies that you mentioned um, with those layers of benefits that come out um, from your own experience. Have most of these projects had them built in at the start or are these things they developed over the course of the project that they realized there was new things they could do during it? Yes, of course. Uh, concerning the very first question, so I think that the, the publications that we develop are a good way of compiling somehow these experiences because uh, I tell you very honestly, uh, these 38 cultural routes, they are grassroots. I mean, they're not imposed by us, the Council of Europe or, or the European Union. So they have a very uh, ownership, which is at the lo local level. But this translates also in difficulties in uh, getting information and data um, research on a regular basis. So this publication actually do compile several uh, good practices. And I think uh, it's a way of getting them in a more easily and accessible way. I will share uh, with you the link uh, straight away with all our our publication and especially the manual they always have good practices uh, uh, then concerning the uh, second uh, question so roots for you this cooperation with the european union so between the two uh, intergovernmental organizations just started in 2017 and we will actually end this year in 2020, was to bring a more regional perspective in the already existing cooperation of cultural routes. Um, the, the other cultural routes and the cooperations that I mentioned date back to different uh, years. They were all recent, uh, but date back also before to uh, 2017. For instance, the example I mentioned about uh, Atrium, uh, this cooperation with young people, actually this was developed in the framework of their interreg in the last uh, cycle of interreg. So um, yeah, the, the timing and the schedule is a bit different. What I think is just the, the key point there is that, uh, okay, interreg, the, the example I mentioned, uh, started as a good way of already bringing partners together, finding common obje objectives and identifying common strategies. The step in uh, becoming a certified cultural route and the examples I gave you at the end actually are made possible thanks to this is that uh, it's a way of ensuring the sustainability of this cooperation. So after the four year, five year cycle of an interreg, this can last and the cooperation which has been established and tested on given activities is given a way to continue. Yes. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Matt's, uh, yeah, now, uh, yeah, well, Matthew Matt's, uh, I think um, you had some interesting um, points uh, on on um, 
on bringing in, uh, let's say, um, uh, the public into uh, contract archaeology. Now, uh, contract archaeology uh, is, uh, let's say, um, uh, also called uh, rescue archaeology or, or, or um, um, so it's 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 paid by the contractor so uh so i would like to ask you matthew um um how does the contractor view uh let's say um this dimension of uh activity i mean are they uh, positive or or how is what 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 type of let's say issues uh, have you experienced uh uh, in this context? Yeah, like I, I mentioned, uh, th there's often been a case of uh, uh, sort of a conflict, of course, economical mostly, uh, but also uh, with the delays and things like that. So certain projects, there's a famous one in Ian Shopping, for instance, where the, the, the developer um, put to put uh, Put the blame on the archaeologist uh, for not uh, coming through with their project, but uh, and and in many smaller projects, this is also the cases where, the, for instance, they need to uh, tear up a road or something as, or street, and they did that this in Norrköping, for instance, and there were delays. And I can't say it had to do with archaeology, but uh, rather it was the developers who were the, the ones who were the problem there. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite common that archaeologists get uh, sort of in between two different interest areas, both culture workers or people who think that contract uh, archaeologists are destroying our heritage and on the other side we see we're seen as a hindrance for for uh, development de development but I think I mean for instance now with Trafik Verket which of course is a government uh, uh, developer uh, it, we have very good uh, discussions we have now for Ustlenk and it's such a huge project that uh, I find that uh, Trafik Verket is actually one of the um, initiative takers on how that project is supposed to be produced and so on. It's not really supposed to be like that, but it's, uh, I know that the, the county admi administration or board, uh, they're all, they're often overheaped with a lot of different issues. So it's, but it's, in the end, it's their decision to how, um, which project is going to um, be chosen, how much is it going to cost, and so on and so forth. So the Swedish law is very strong there. If you compare to, in, I were, used to work in the UK and Ireland, for instance, where it was much more direct uh, um, uh, discussions between the developers and the archaeological companies. So. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, there's also been a bit of development from. I answered a question before. I was a person who asked how CA worked in Sweden, and traditionally it was conducted by the National Heritage Board. I used to work for them, and the museums. I used to work for a museum as well, the county museums, and there were just a few companies. But now it's shifted, so the National Heritage Board. It's not considered to, they were sitting in two places in the same time, both uh, as a government, like a uh, decision maker and, and uh, um, one of the participants. So, so now it's more like uh, private companies uh, that are uh, conducting CA. Uh, and uh, I can also see that there are a lot of the like development developer companies that have um, um, got hold of archaeologists and start to, to do archaeological uh, work, especially in the case of, uh, like I said, land, uh, landscape assessment, heritage assessment, environmental assessments, and things like that. 
before an excavation, but also getting into excavations themselves in some part. So this is a, I, I see this as a, as a trend in a way in Sweden. My, may I add something there? Um, I have experiences from uh, urban archaeology, medieval archaeology, and uh, if if there has been for a long time contract archaeology running in the town, there has also established a sort of cooperation with individuals that facilitates um, the, the 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 planning of archaeological excavations. Sometimes there's a break when a new person gets in and, and it's not educated by the former person. But I think um, mostly the, uh, in, in those cases where you have archaeological interesting towns like Lund, Sigtuna, Visby and so on, there is um, an understanding between the archaeologists and uh, the, the entrepreneurs. Also with the large entrepreneurs like Trafikverket and, and uh, other large uh, governmental uh, facilities. And um, also in Sweden, there is, you, you don't, if you have a, uh, you have um, a firm, a contract archeological firm, you don't get a permit um, unless you have some part of your project, the money and project, decisively used for disseminating the knowledge to the public. So you could say the entrepreneurs, they have to pay. <laughs> but at the same time, there are, most of the time, I, I've been um, uh, positively astonished that they actually like being invited to lectures and they are all excited about uh, what we find. And also they bring in, for instance, important guests to visit the sites, or you give a lecture for these important guests. So um, there is, there is, there are many good examples of the cooperation in that sense. Yeah, uh, if I can answer that again, it's one of my Graska uh, PhD colleagues. She's actually studying th th this this field of urban archaeology and uh, how um, uh, she's actually. A lot of companies uh, are telling her that she's she's really taking part of uh, um, sort of an enhancement of the cultural values of a city that has a broader effect outside just the, the excavation itself. Mm -hmm. You can put like a, a brand or something like that to a place and, and give, give the the. the uh, I mean, Norrköping is a really good example for changing the industrial area into a, a, a new function where it, it's a sort of a cozy area for companies to, uh, to establish themselves and restaurants and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, yeah, things like that to um, promote history and, and archaeology to, to a, a, a place, a city uh, we can yeah, be helpful in also economical sense, I think. Mm. Uh, might I add also an, an example from Kalma on the east coast of Sweden with the uh, Akilogena. Stefan Larsson had a big project there together with the, the city and uh, made a good, uh, had good cooperation with them. So mm. we have uh, some good examples of, and that they, they are communal or state organizations, of course, but also private companies. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, um, we are following different threads here and uh, I will start with uh, the YouTube thread. There is a, a question uh, which says, um, and it's addressed to the whole panel, um, how can these great initiatives, and I think uh, it's uh, the cultural roots uh, uh, initiatives, how can uh, they uh, balance the emphasis laid upon on site experience with the amounts of information we have about the objects of study? So, um, so um, yeah. Um, 
do we get the question or um, uh, don't no understand. no um me neither but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah i will yeah come again um, yeah. yeah well yeah i have to uh, i have to uh, yeah. then i can see on another thread um <coughs> where um where nick uh, asked uh laura uh, yeah uh eu laura uh not uh <laughs> au laura um <laughs> he asked about uh stakeholders um and um, participation of stakeholders in uh, EU projects. And uh, EU, Laura, has already answered, but I think um, maybe uh, it is better to, let's say, uh, get it uh, uh, recorded in uh, this video stream. So please. Yes, so definitely the, the, the idea, the objective was not to add upon what is existing, but to make, make use and make profit of what is already existing. So the cultural roots are grassroots level, definitely. I mean, they start from people like you who are interested in coming together and working together on a given project. So uh, this is one uh, one aspect. Um, so we were not uh, establishing a new group of cooperation, but bringing together these cultural roots with the macro region. So with the political level at the national level and also local and regional authorities, because also several cultural roots uh, have their headquarter within uh, um, um, local authorities like town hall offices. And this is also another aspect that can ensure somehow in keeping the sustainability of the cooperation. We uh, experienced actually a lot of interest when the action was really target, targeted in a different way, in a sharp way to the target audience, in a sense. The, um, the publications, uh, the different studies, they might be of interest for, for everyone, but they do target actually different target groups. Those who are interested in policies, in understanding, okay, which are the policies in my region? I know maybe my national legislation, I don't know about the uh, regional dimension for establishing a signposting along our sites. This might be of interest for giving people. Uh, they learning the first module about the certification of cultural route. This makes sense for those who want to establish a cultural route and also those who want to get an understanding of what is the, um, the, the idea behind. The others, like for instance, the one about attractiveness of remote destination might make more sense for okay, a person who's handling a site which is in a rural area and in, faces some difficulties and wants to learn from other practices. So I think uh, the engagement was very much working when the target was uh, sharp. And also we organized several uh, workshops in the field. In two years, we organized around 10 events with each uh, event, three different workshops because of thematic and the participation was, uh, was wide. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, enlightening answer. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, the, I still don't have a, a rephrase of, of that question. So, uh, so it's, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, Nick is raising his hand. Are you Nick? No. <laughs> yeah, we. It was okay with the answer that I got from Laura. So okay. No, okay. No, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, yeah. Um, well. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, I had a list of uh, questions, but uh, let's see. Um, yeah, but we have been into long term sust sustainability. We have been into assessment and evaluation. Um, we have been on cross border perspectives. Uh, so uh, my question list is a bit uh, empty now uh, so so um yeah um let's 
So, are mm. we approaching the end, or uh, are we too tired to, uh, or, um, or, yeah? Okay. Well, um, ah, here is one. Great. Uh, so, um, it's a question uh, to everybody. Um, what are your visions for the legacy of the Archaeobalt project? So that's one question. And the other question is uh, addressed to, uh, to Nick. Uh, it is, what are the plans uh, for uh, the uh, sort of mult site? I mean, what are the long-term, uh, uh, do you plan to have a, let's say, a visitor centers like uh, at Uboka? Uh, so we have uh, these two, um, two questions. So Nick, you can think about uh, your answer while uh, we will ask, we will go to uh, everybody on the visions of the legacy of the Archaeobalt project. So uh, that should be mainly Carolina. Are you with us, Carolina? Okay, uh, I'm all the time with you. <laughs> um, uh, if you're thinking about the legacy of uh, Archaeobalt uh, project, um, I think <clears throat> I see it in, in a few perspectives. When we start uh, working with the project, one of the elements which appeared in the very beginning is uh, let's say stronger uh, cooperation. Right now we are working as uh, separate institutions. So um, I see it um, as another project, which will give us opportunity to develop the idea of Archaeobalt uh, project. Right now we start as a three countries, five institutions, uh, but I see an opportunity to uh, involve, to, uh, to um, uh, to involve uh, institutions from other countries and in this way uh, reach um, Baltic uh, archaeobalt heritage. Uh, thank you, Laura, uh, you, Laura, for, uh, for your presentation. <laughs> and uh, I think that the opportunity which you present us, uh, they are also very useful. And I think that we should uh, also um, put this topic uh, on the table. <clears throat> And think about uh, about this this, um, this option, which already uh, appeared. Uh, so I think right now about next project uh, in which we'll link more uh, more institutions, and in this way develop the, the idea. Because when we start with uh, seed money project uh, a few years ago, um, technically speaking, uh, we create let's say something like a strategy we are talking down there about the baltic heritage about um cooperation with the institutions creating a, a studies uh, but we have to start with this cooperation on on one level and then make a next step so this is um, the idea for a moment let's say which which uh, which appeared Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Carolina. And uh, could I uh, give the word to, uh, to to Nick on the on the Bornholm issue? Um, well, the the future of Bornholm, uh, well, the future of uh, Sotomul depends on all the strategies we are now defining to uh, set up the good foundations for this project to become a long term project. This is the first time that uh, the project uh, is back again into work uh, before the project that was there back in the 80s. Uh, so now we need to, to really consider all the strategies which are necessary to keep this project ongoing for several years. It's a very big side. It is a very impressive uh, in order to compete with, uh, with Upraka. There is a lot of work to be done. And obviously, a lot of efforts have to be put into the same track, uh, coordination with other institutions, looking for the resources, 
trying to work more on the archaeological center, which is something that might also help us to keep on moving this project, not only during the excavation time, but also off season, because that's also one of the ideas out of this Archibald project. What do we do when we are not excavating? How do we present what we are doing? How do we show this other part of the project, which also is uh, important for the job and uh, also people is interested in looking at. So we need to define all that thing and uh, obviously the idea right now for the museum is to keep Sotomul as a long-term project, but is is what we are working on right now. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. That was, yeah. uh, that was interesting. Um, so I, I think uh, that uh, we in general um, can um, see a shift, let's see, from uh, in, archeo in archaeology in general towards, let's say, uh, integrating the uh, outreach uh, aspects uh, into, let's say, uh, almost every um, every project. So, uh, uh, so Matthew, I think you 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 have. Uh, uh, a, a great task uh, to do here and to uh, uh, give it a, um, a, a research uh, perspective. Uh, so uh, congrats uh, with, with the progress of, of your uh, project. So um, now um, I am a bit nothing here, nothing there. So um, um yeah um uh, so i would uh, i would ask e eu laura um um how how do you see the uh, let's say the um the approach uh, that we um in, engage in in this uh, in this project i mean you have been a bit into it but but maybe uh yeah maybe you could expand on on that because i mean um yeah we we are interested in uh uh in how um you look at uh what yes um, so i i listened with very much uh, interesting uh, the the very specific activities that you were mentioning for instance concerning the the, the pupils uh, the youngsters uh, this educational aspect that I think is very much developed also because you can basically most from educational institution you have in your mind the idea of uh, teaching. <laughs> so this is uh, um, very positive. What I understood were a bit uh, the, the challenges that were mentioned before was uh, um, finding the, the right narratives, the right way to convey this message. I understood the um, there are several activities uh, which concern, for instance, festivals, reenactment, reenactment. Uh, maybe thinking about also different, uh, um, different other ways. Uh, um, I don't know about the the, the techniques, uh, a bit uh, the the, the know-how. This might be a way to add upon what is already existing. That it's a uh, it's a lot, and then I think what would add a lot into this. Uh, Mm, cooperation project that you have because you come from different countries uh, you uh, talked about very different uh, sites uh, from different uh, times uh, and what might be uh, interesting and the answer on one hand also to the fact of maybe not the possibility of traveling taking the flight to go from one country to the other and on the other hand about okay i'm in a given site in a given destination but i understand that i'm part of a broader network is to uh, I don't know, put a bit of the stress on this uh, communication aspect uh, as a site as part of a broader network. Um, I don't know, maybe some techniques, uh, some uh, elements, some, uh, for instance, Professor Finn Olen, if I'm right, um, show uh, um, um, an image of golden um, a warrior probably, and he said, okay, maybe he's not a king, probably he's not a king because he does not have the ring. And before he talked about the ring. So one way of connecting this and giving a broader idea of the larger network might be focusing on, yes, the symbols, the elements. Okay, uh, if this can be found like a recurrent pattern or a recurrent theme, 
I would, I don't know, I was just thinking about this while listening to the previous presentation. And of course I would, I think that what would help a lot is yes, also somehow um, signaling this uh, with signposting uh, in, a, in a coherent, uh, in a coherent uh, way. Just some considerations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, we, I mean, we have been uh, uh, talking uh, about these uh, issues uh, in in the project. Uh, so, uh, so Mats Roslund came up with the idea of of uh, the narrative main umbrella narrative of places of power, and I think uh, that would link uh, very closely to the. Uh, Let's say iconography of the finds and 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 so 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 uh, so so these symbolic uh, expressions. Um, yeah, I mean we could uh, we could uh, promote them uh, or, or contextualize them uh, um, better. I think so. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, yeah. Just one point. Yeah, <laughs> it relates somehow to what Carolina was uh, was saying in the sense that you started this cooperation. It's very ambitious. You already gained a lot of result, but she said you are still working as a separate institution. Maybe coming together to a point of having a structure, which also from a legal point of view uh, makes this somehow sustainable as network. You all have also students who were involved. Finding a way to make this type of cooperation lasting for longer, I think cannot but be beneficial. Point taken. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was uh... one word. Uh, that's why uh, in, in the present my presentation, we all I also mentioned about the network of archaeological centers. So the place when we where can meet the professionalists. Also, in this case, let's uh, from from Matthew perspective, contact archaeology. Uh, the, the places which will give us durability. So we start right now with, with three points, but I don't see any problem to create similar places. For example, Lithuania, I would say they already have some fantastic places and they are also open to, to, to cooperation. So we see it, to, we are, let's say, in the starting point and then we can develop it. But as I said, we are very, I, I'm very open to, 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 to suggestions in which direction you would like to, to go. So I see it as at the beginning. <laughs> at the beginning, but beginning. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that extension, uh, Carolina. Yeah, um, so uh, we have lost uh, AU, Laura, her laptop has, uh, um, yeah, uh, had, a uh, shortage and in, in battery life, so uh, so, so she has uh, left us not because she doesn't like us, I hope, but uh, <laughs> uh, because of technical reasons. So um, yeah, um, so boop boop boop. Um, yeah, let's take a view. Are there any? Andre, do you have any? Questions? No. Um, yeah. Um, well, then, um, yeah, then we have uh, reached the end. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a very uh, interesting day. I mean, um, and I think. Uh, I, d I don't know, uh, but, but uh, uh, in my view, um, I don't know. Um, I mean, this was uh, originally scheduled as a open seminar, okay, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, and and it was also open, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and and in fact, I mean. Um, I don't know if because I cannot see who is attending on on the YouTube. Uh, so, but but now we have uh, let's say a document, and we can uh, we can uh, sort of uh, edit it and 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 then um, and and address uh, stakeholders uh, directly on 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 different topics, and we can 
also listen uh, to it again and say, okay, here uh, here's something we uh, might uh, look at. So um, yeah, uh, so I think it has been uh, extremely beneficial. Uh, so thank you uh, for all of you and um, um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The sad thing of 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 saying uh, goodbye is <laughs> is the goodbye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, keep healthy um, to all, and um, thank you for your engagement, your work, and um, I will stop the uh, YouTube uh, channel transmission uh, now if I if it's possible.